Welcome to our Knowledge Exchange webinar with Timber Design Initiatives. This is the first collaborative webinar uh, between CIAT Yorkshire and the Scotland East region. We're very, uh, very excited to have Peter Wilson with us here today to launch this collaboration for sharing knowledge uh, across multiple regions. So uh, I want to give a little introduction to CIAT, Scotland East Region, for those of you out there who may not be familiar with us. So like the Yorkshire region, uh, we have a committee and the committee is made up of AT practitioners, academics and policy leaders. Um, and uh, with a background in house building, private practice, retrofit, building performance, design for disassembly, design for deconstruction, design for assembly, uh, and much more. So I am the Scotland East Regional Chair. Uh, I'm standing in for our region's aspiration chair today, Alex Stickle. Uh, she sends her apologies for not being able to make it. Uh, and I hope that many of you joining us today will be from uh, our region's centre of excellence in RGU or ENU. Right, so this uh, which takes me very nicely into introducing our speaker. So I'm very proud and privileged to welcome Peter Wilson. Peter is prolific in the world of designing with mass timber. So before founding timber design initiatives, Peter led an R&D centre at Edinburgh Napier, uh, Edinburgh Napier University's Institute for Sustainable Construction, which is part of Napier's CIAT Centre of Excellence, which Peter was a fundamental driving force in developing a strong and methodical research culture to underpin the learning and understanding of for the innovative use of timber within the AT discipline as we know it. So Peter is at the, the forefront of timber innovation in the built environment and has contributed to and helped to shape our understanding of designing with timber at academic, practical and policy level. So we are very lucky to have uh, Peter with us this afternoon. So Peter, welcome to you. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, if all goes well, I'll be passing over to you to share your screen if that's, if that's I'll okay. Do, I'll do my best. Um, well, um, right, let, I'll just introduce myself to people. Um, John gave me a very fulsome praise there, which I, I you know, is um, how do you live up to it kind of thing. Um, I um, am an architect. I have been working with uh, things to do with timber for about 20 years probably and really a lot of that time has been spent exploring the world of um, mass timber in terms of engineered timber systems uh, solid laminate timber systems if you like and uh, you know a lot of that time has been spent trying to get these things into production in the UK um, not yet uh, entirely successful because a lot of things that uh, mitigate against that but we I've seen in the last few years a lot of uh, new buildings emerge in the UK using cross-laminated timber. Obviously, glue lamb has been around for a long time, but other materials, laminated veneer lumber, uh, uh, dowel laminated timber, and so on. So really, uh, this uh, is a kind of follow-on from a previous um, presentation I did for Yorkshire uh, Aspiration. And... Um, then I talk generally about uh, mass timber, but what, one of the things I'm particularly working on at the moment is looking at how do we make more use of, I, I'll just keep referring to mass timber, but I'll come to a better explanation of that in a moment. Um, how do we make better use of it uh, or possible use of it in historic buildings, traditional buildings? Um, you know, a lot of buildings around the country are run down or they're unused and they've been unused for a long time. They're kind of derelict. There's others that are historic buildings that have maybe been listed, not necessarily to grade one or grade eight in Scotland, um, but, uh, but, but they have um, certain qualities. Now, I'll just, uh, if you forgive me for a moment, I'll just uh, ask me, Ethan if he's up and running yet. To... He's obviously up. He's obviously can, you, up. Uh, can you see this, uh, the screen? Yep, come on uh, through yeah. nice and clear. Yeah, I can see it now. Thanks very right, much. Perfect. Well done. Right. OK, so um, now the picture you see in front of you is is, is mass timber. It's mass. It's actually hardwood cross laminated timber. 
that uh, we made in Scotland a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. And this was um, the first hardwood uh, cross-laminated timber made anywhere, really, uh, that's, um, in terms of any scale of production. But this is a, a project that Wachthistles and Architects and Arps designed for the London Design Festival. And you can see almost every piece of uh, strip of wood there, you can see the layers of the, in the CLT in the connections. You can see the bolted parts which connect it. And it's 17 boxes set up as a kind of three-dimensional maze that was used in London Design Festival in the V&A's courtyard in uh, Kensington in London. And the objective in making this was to use a very, very lightweight hardwood, because most hardwoods are quite dense, and so they're heavy and they're not really what we'd use for making um, solid laminate timber systems because the, the panels would be too heavy uh, and so on. But this is very lightweight, but incredibly strong and stiff tulip wood from the east coast of America. And it's, uh, it's, it grows all the way down the Appalachian mountain range. Um, but it's mostly used in America to make furniture and to make uh, veneers for plywood. And so the objective was to use the lowest grade of that timber to see if we can make uh, structurally uh, acceptable uh, panels that would um, actually function in terms of uh, a template for modular housing. So, uh, Ethan, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, that's just me. Um, some I've written a number of books and all sorts of things to do with timber. Uh, I run a company called Timber Design Initiatives, and more recently we set up a, a spin-off from that, which is the Mass Timber Academy, and I'll tell you more about that later. Next. Hello? Right, so why mass timber? And I think um, this slide kind of says it all. In the 19th century, we had iron and steel. Those were the main new materials or new structural materials we had then. And we see many, many buildings around the UK and elsewhere made from those um, materials. The 20th century, we moved on probably by the 1920s to reinforced concrete, and that became almost universal, either in, in situ concrete or in uh, prefabricated. Um, um, concrete, but uh, we've, we've kind of moved on now because other things have um, taken over in terms of the climate emergency, in terms of net zero carbon targets, uh, but also just the need to look at using more of the more renewable materials to look towards more sustainable architecture and so on. So next please. And and there we go. So, so I'll just say here, okay, in terms of what Something keeps happening here, but uh, uh, in terms of the the world we live in today, in 2021, these are the kind of issues we're trying to address. The, the circular economy, the use of renewable materials, looking at UN Sustainable Development Goals, and carbon sequestration, because being the principal renewable material we have for construction, you know, we, there's also um, bamboo, which is a grass, uh, but carbon sequestration is quite important. And, and also the replanting or the natural regeneration of forests in terms of being able to get more material. So, uh, next please. And when I talk about mass timber or solid laminate timber products, I'm really referring to dowel laminated timber, cross laminated timber, glue lam, nail laminated timber, and laminated veneer lumber. Uh, DLT is just kind of stacked boards with, uh, well, the most basic version of dowel laminated timber is stacked boards with the grain all running in the same direction, holes drilled through, and hardwood rods um, pushed into the softwood. And when the moisture content of the two meet, um, the, the, the hardwood expands and locks the, all the boards together. So it's an unglued system, as is further on nail laminated timber, which is a, basically a similar thing, although each board is nailed to the next one. Cross laminated timber, glue lam, and nail laminated timber, these are um, well, we're firing on. This is extraordinary. This is a, a kind of presentation where I don't press any buttons and things appear out of the blue. But um, uh, hopefully you've got... The, the, what I was about to say there was there are the three of the five versions here are glued systems. Nail laminated timber and dowel laminated timber are non-glued. This is just a, a kind of nail laminated a panel made in the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre near Glasgow, which is... Uh, it's using wooden nails, which are basically compressed beech uh, rods with with um, in, in them. There's a kind of phenolic resin. So these are fired in hydraulically with a nail gun very fast. And so the phenolic resin has a kind of gluing effect as well as just the nailed 
the friction of the nails holding the whole panel together. And you can see the stepped uh, elements of the timber there. That's really to do with um, getting a better acoustic quality. So we turn this upside down for a ceiling panel, you get uh, you can reduce the reverberation of a sound you get with a flat panel. Next, please. And this is, uh, and I'm not even going to try, this is a little um, film in the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre of more recently making full-size cross-laminated timber panels, uh, glue lam panels and nail laminated panels from UK grown timber, in this instance Scottish grown timber, because most Scotland has most of the production forestry in the UK, and so we've been working away at trying to develop these kind of systems for some years. In fact, I think I've been involved in this for about 14 years. And so we're beginning to see now the possibilities of making panels here. It might take some time to get factories established in the UK because even getting the machines to make this kind of stuff is about a four year lead in time at the moment because around the world, this is where the industry is going. There are massive amounts of new buildings going up in North America and in Europe in cross laminated timber. And I'll come on to reasons for that in a moment. Next, please. Uh, the next one, I think, is just another little film that we won't bother to go through. Uh, yeah, just skip past this one, Ethan, please. Um, so um, I'm saying all this because for those of you who have no experience of uh, any of these products, poss possibly glue lamb, but maybe not um, the uh, cross laminated timber or um, almost certainly not dowel laminated timber and almost certainly not laminated veneer lumber. These are more recent things in this country. Um, there's some text has disappeared here, but uh, uh, that's a publication I was involved in the production of and I wrote case studies for a few years ago, which really is um, available from, from our Mass Timber Academy, but it's, uh, it really gives you background to all the research, how these things are made, what kind of projects are possible with them, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of basic introduction, a kind of handbook, if you like. So let's move on. The point is that all of that work in that book has been based on many, many years of, of timber research at Edinburgh Napier University. It was set up, first of all, to be a centre for timber engineering to look at how do we get more timber into construction in the UK. And the need to do that was really based on having to train engineers in something that they're not normally trained in and still aren't. Uh, for that reason. Um, so, okay, what I want to talk to you about today is really about how we use mass timber in uh, traditional buildings, where there are opportunities to regenerate buildings uh, in a quite different way from the way we would normally go about it. So I've, I've established here six categories, if you like, that uh, seem to be different approaches to how we might do this. Temporary use, um, and I'll show you some slides of this. Uh, installations, you can read these words. Um, there's no point in me rereading them to you. But let's just go to the next slide and we'll start with looking at temporary use because uh, where we can do things with timber, um, just pass this one, uh, please, Ethan. Yeah, if you, you've all be aware of the fire that happened in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris a couple of years ago. and the work that's had to be done and will go on for many years, I think, in terms of trying to restore the building to its former glory. Um, one of the ways they've been doing this is to use uh, mass timber construction to put, if you can see in the left hand slide, big glue lamb beams, but actually much lighter than any other form of construction to lay onto the uh, existing walls and build a platform uh, under which people can work in terms of rebuilding the roof structure of the cathedral. Uh, you can also see the, on the right hand slide the, the flying buttresses are all supported on mass timber construction, a real kind of um, framework underneath to not just support the buttresses but to support the walls as well from pushing outwards. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for this kind of thing in construction where we tend to just um, I suppose, go for more traditional kind of large complex um, scaffolding systems and so on. But here, there was a cr chronic need to say, how can we do lighter weight construction and how can we do it in a way that's um, compatible with the 
existing building. So next slide, please, because I'll explain this a little bit more with the next one. OK, so there are, I said there are many projects around Britain, but there's also projects around the world where there are, uh, if you like, ruins that are kind of standing or half standing, whatever way you want to describe them. This is a tower in um, uh, near Barcelona. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, you'll see what's been done to stabilize the wall because it's just, you know, it's one wall left of the tower. Next slide, please. And you can see here uh, that just they've built a whole um, timber structure, which not only stabilizes the wall, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see actually how fragile that wall is in terms of its ability to uh, not, not fall over, if you like. You can also see in the left-hand slide that there's a staircase structure within that framework and the framework is it's not laminated timber it's big solid chunks uh, tree chunks if you like uh, that have been cut down and to build this structure that complements the existing wall if you like braces it but complements it and next slide please um provides viewing access all the way up the structure to uh view at the, at the rampart level just see how you would see out from the tower and in, in when it was in its former glory and also just see its position on a hill in the landscape so again this is uh, something that's the timber complements the kind of stone structure of the thing without uh having to interfere to kind of when i say interfere not having to kind of reconstruct parts of the stone structure to stabilize it we can we can attach the timber to it in a very light light way so next slide please Next, uh, okay, so the next category is where we can uh, actually um, look at how do we insert things into uh, existing structures where we can create our, a new purpose, if you like. So next. This is um, a little project in this is 17th century pigsty, which I suppose most people would think, oh, let's just knock it down. But here the architects have actually created a thing where inserting a box within the structure, um, so not interfering with the existing structure at all, but also not having to build new foundations because this the timber is a much more lightweight structure. So drop it into the core of the existing walls, re-roof it, and basically, um, you know, to a certain extent, stabilize the walls, which you can see have all sorts of cracks and missing parts and so on. And they'll put a little uh, furniture showroom into the building. So it's a very simple, uh, approach, but I think you, we have probably all seen ruins around the country where you think, oh, we could probably do that. You know, it's, um, they're not spectacular buildings in themselves, but actually we could give it a new purpose without um, having to go through the whole demolition process and new foundations and everything else. Next. And to take this a little bit further, um, this is a building down in Somerset um, by Hugh Strange Architects. And this was an old, um, basically run-down farm buildings that uh, the owner of the farm has a large archive of very, very good architectural drawings and wanted somewhere to store them and display them. And uh, Hugh Strange uh, elected to try to do something here. Normally, if any of you have been involved in any uh, exhibition or museum or gallery projects, I've been involved in quite a lot over many years, um, you're always trying to get a consistent um, humidity and temperature uh, so that there's no decomposition in particularly fragile drawings and things like this. Here, if you go to the next slide, you can see that what's behind the slide, what's behind the wall there is a whole kind of cross laminated timber box. Whole new structure has been built inside the existing walls. So the, the kind of the, the sense of context in terms of the area, the kind of local architecture and so on is maintained, but at the same time, a whole new modern construction is installed inside. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, what you have there is very thick walls, very thick CLT roofs. Now, normally, in a lot of um, standard um, cross laminated timber construction, you would see uh, panels that are maybe 120, 150 millimeters thick. These are about 300 millimetres thick in the walls and about 450 millimetres thick in the in the roof. And this is a really interesting approach because 
obviously, from an economic point of view, um, your first instinct is to say, well, goodness me, that's a lot more timber and uh, obviously going to be cost a lot more. But what it does here is that um, the sheer thickness of the walls and the roof allow the internal air quality to be sustained at a, 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 or maintained at a consistent temperature and humidity so that no matter what's happening outside weather-wise, the, the temperature profile across and the, the moisture profile across the wall doesn't penetrate to the interior. So in this instance, where you're saving money on um, the roof and the wall thickness, uh, where, you, where you're not saving money, I should say, on the roof and the wall, you are saving money by having no mechanical ventilation or air conditioning systems that you would normally find in museums or galleries uh, to create the right ambient temperature and humidity for the artefacts. So this is a kind of very interesting approach because it's a completely passive approach to how do we maintain these kind of built, um, modern building functions. Next, please. Okay, the next category of the, of the six that I listed. Um, if we go to the next slide. And this is a, where there's an existing structure trying to uh, give the structure new purpose, if you like. And this uh, water tower in Norfolk has been converted from a steel framed, uh, just, just a frame with a tank on top, into a home. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see here just a kind of schematic idea. You can see the frame, you can see the water tank on top, but behind it is an enclosed staircase. And that's linked, uh, uh, there's a separating link to join that to the, the water tower. Next. Uh, you can just see a plan and a section there of how that's uh, kind of orchestrated in terms of just the, the linkage to the, the, the tower and the rooms that are inserted inside the existing steel frame. Next. And there's the various elements. You can see the, the rooms are made of CLT. There's the existing tank. There's a roof terrace above it. Um, the structure has been modified to fit in the, the CLT. Uh, there's a bridge and then there's an enclosed staircase. Next. And it's got what we in Scotland call wrinkly tin uh, around the structure and it's just been completely renovated. Uh, but there's, there, you can still see the what was the original building, the, the, the exposed structure and the tank. Next. And this is just the linkage between the, the staircase and the uh, the existing structure. Next, and uh, and the stair itself is a beautiful construction. So it says it's a compression stair. The, the treads are cantilevered out from the wall and sit on top of each other. So all the way up, there's a it's a self-standing kind of structure, if you like. And it's, and the thing about these kind of things, um, if you haven't ever been in one, is when you walk into a staircase like this, the smell of the timber is just I won't say overpowering, but it's just incredibly relaxing. Um, you know, you just feel yourself calming down immediately. Not so much at the prospect of climbing such a tall stair, but uh, since there's no lift, but um, but there we go. Next. And just the, one of the, the living rooms in the, in the space. But the, the timber is exposed, so what you have with the with the, the benefit solid timber walls and the exposed surfaces like this is you have you take advantage of the timber's natural, what they call hygroscopicity, which is that the you know timber's a breathing material. It absorbs moisture in the atmosphere. It releases it, you know, later, and that's why you know at uh, different times of day we can get a kind of very good air quality in a room and so on because you're you're working with nature. And I'll, I'll explain that a bit more later. But if we go to the next slide, and that's just. The tank itself it's been uh, kind of i suppose brushed down in terms of what, what was there there's a window put in uh, but the, the the original tank is still there it's not been removed or or completely um replaced it's just there it is you can stand there you climb up a stair you look out okay next next please I'm trying to catch up here because of the time we lost at the beginning. So if I 
forgive me for trying to kind of push along. Next, sorry. So buildings adjacent to historic structures, I mean, obviously something like Revo Abbey, there's very little likelihood you're going to get permission to drop another structure inside it because these are sort of, um, you know, top of the listing kind of charts, if you like. Um, but, but, but they do get a lot of visitors. And it's really how to control that visitor interaction with the ruins. We have quite a few in Scotland at the moment where they've had to be closed because there's been stonework falling off and so on. So, uh, but if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, what's been built next to it um, by Simpson and Brown Architects. It's very elegant, simple uh, timber structure, which is made up of a whole series of uh, glue lamp portal frames. Next. And it's positioned on the site to just have that kind of if you see that pink triangle, it's really to give maximum viewing angle from the end elevation there to uh, to the, the abbey and set you on the path to go to go around and enter the, the ruins directly. OK, next. That's just from the car park in, inside the, 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 the parallel um, frames, the portal frames are really set out in such a way that they can put display cases in between. And so as you pass through, you're, um, you're looking at all sorts of artifacts to do with the history of the Abbey. Next. OK, so we're rapidly moving on to category five. There's a few more examples here of things. Next, sorry. Um, OK, we're just jumping continents now because this is a Really interesting building from the 17th century, which was uh, kind of ruined, you know, the, uh, it was to do with the, the existing industry there, the kind of salt industry and so on. Um, go to the next slide. And what's been, uh, Lino Bobardi, who's one of the great 20th century uh, Brazilian architects, she put in this um, incredible staircase into the existing structure and using quite a bit of the existing timber um, that had been re kind of, um, brought from other parts of the building complex. So it was a sugar mill. It was a big, a big house and a chapel at slaves' quarters. And it's now a um, um, museum and gallery kind of thing. But I, mean, I think the, the stairs an ingenious piece of structural engineering. And it's, it's become almost the focal point of the display because everything is kind of wrapped around that. So uh, it's really how do you take advantage of the existing structure and work with it to do something that's possible with modern technology, if you like, but still looking at the kind of traditional kind of details and how things were done uh, way back in the 17th century. OK, next. Uh, right, we'll jump back to Europe and go to Brussels. This The Gare Maritime was a big um, transit kind of railway station in uh, Brussels for goods and so on. And it's laying empty for a long time. Cast iron structure, glass, so on. and. What's, what's been happened in, more, um, in the last few years is just to really repair the whole existing structure. Next slide, please. And insert a complete new uh, interior in terms of cross laminated timber, glue lamp, and so on, to create a whole kind of um, a sort of mini city in here of all sorts of different functions, offices, uh, retail functions, and so on. Next. And all of this was kind of prefabricated because so you can bring these big panels, bring complete staircases and so on to site, pre-assembled and just clip them all together. Because the great thing about um, modern timber systems is because of the lamination process and because the timber has been dried down to quite low moisture contents, you, when you cross laminate it, you get um, very dimensionally stable panels. So the, the, the shrinkage that you would find in normal bits of timber so it doesn't really happen because it's controlled by the, the gluing and the cross lamination process. So in a building like this, you'll find that maybe over 10, 15 years, it'll, any kind of shrinkage is limited to a matter of a few millimetres at most. Next. I think the next one will. It's very teasing, isn't it? You just don't know what the next slide is going to be. Um, Next, actually, here we go. So there are some notes about just what it is. It's a huge building. The whole external skin's been retained. They've repaired all the girders and trusses. 
and whole series of new buildings. And that's what I mean about just being like a little city with lots of streets crossing and um, avenues and so on that people can percolate through the whole thing. It's quite a remarkable structure and quite an ambitious uh, project. So next, please. And I talked about traditional buildings, but for me now, um, concrete, reinforced concrete buildings from the 20th century are traditional. We're already seeing some things listed and so on, uh, which you know, a lot of people don't like. They don't like the color of the concrete or the way it weathers or whatever. But here in Berlin, beside the Jewish museum that Daniel Liebeskind did, they've created this, um, it's basically, Anonym is an abbreviation of Noah's Ark. They've created this kind of Noah's Ark structure for children. It's a sort of children's museum beside the um, Jewish museum. Next, please. And it's, you can see it's this kind of circular uh, donut kind of, if you like, um, inserted as a, uh, a way of reusing a vast space. Next. And you can see here just the, that how the donut is formed. You can see them, some glue lamb beans protruding from there underneath the concrete structure. Next. And within it, um, using the curved structure to really give the sense of being in some kind of arc. And you can see that the arc has lots of animals and things for children to play with. So, so it's a kind of interesting interpretation, but also what's possible with uh, modern timber technology where we can not just curve in one direction, we can curve in two directions, we can do a whole range of things that we could never previously do with straightforward um, pieces of wood cut from a tree trunk. Uh, modern engineered timber is quite a different phenomenon and really how do we take advantage of that? Because uh, Go to the next slide please. So, uh, you know, we'll go, we've been around the world here, we'll come back to England. Grimsby's uh, has had a hard history in recent years and a lot of the traditional industries, uh, shipping or not shipping, the fishing industries largely disappeared in terms of the scale it once was. And this was uh, this factory was just used to produce ice for the, the when the fish came into port, um, how to just preserve it and so on. And the factory's been unused since the 90s. It's lain as a kind of derelict wreck, really. And uh, in the next slide, Walk Thistles and Architects in London, who are probably one of the leading practices, I would say, in the UK in terms of really exploring the potential of mass timber systems. They've um, done a scheme for this. It's into um, planning application stage at the moment to look to retain the existing structure, but build within it a complete new interior, um, which is actually quite a substantial project. When you go to the next slide, it's a uh, the design is to create a whole timber theatre inside the uh, existing factory and to give it a new use because it's never going to get back to producing ice. You know, um, the kind of hankering after you knowing what things one might once have been isn't really um, possible in, in the modern world. You, you know, you either demolish things or you find a better way of using them. And here it's finding a better way of using it, which is using sustainable materials, lightweight structures within existing uh, buildings, within existing foundations and so on. How do we do things that are, um, have that have all the qualities we want to achieve in modern architecture in terms of what's possible in t as we strive to deliver on net zero carbon targets and other things. So this is a project that's still in, in process, if you like, but I put it in here because the ambition of looking at some of these big structures and places like Grimsby or Sheffield or whatever, how do we do it? How do we do it affordably? Um, you know, because some of the buildings are so large, you just stand back and think, where do you start? You know, so here we're looking at big functions for big projects. Next, please. This is at a more domestic scale, just a simple house, and you can see. It was a kind of ruined structure. You can see from the right hand slide the, the plaster peeling off the, the walls. And then at the top of the main wall, you can see the reinforced concrete that's been used to just stabilize the, the top of the wall and, and sit the roof on it. Next, please. And this is what, what I would call, uh, yeah, you can, you can see better there the way in the, which the roof structures um, uh, creates a kind of eaves to protect the top of the wall as well. 
Uh, next, please. And inside, you can see this is a kind of hybrid. It's, it's got glue lamb uh, beams. It's got long uh, glue lamb on its side to make up the, the roof structure. Um, each of those, you can see the kind of lines between on the roof. These are, these are glue lamb beams on their side. Uh, and then you've got the existing wall structure, and you, which has got um, concrete wall heads. Um, so a combination of things, and inside a new courtyard has been put in with a, a reinforced concrete stair. Okay, next. I think they do these things very well in Spain. Um, they, I think since the, probably the, since the 1970s, the whole attitude to how do they use existing buildings and how do they treat them in a way that's both modern but respects the old structure is in many, many places very, very beautifully, elegantly and minimally done. Here you can see all, all the materials are clear, you know, where the junctions are, what the materials are, how they relate to each other. And timber has a kind of fantastic quality against concrete. It has a kind of warmth and colour against the coldness of the, uh, the reinforced concrete. So it's a nice kind of interaction, nice balance. Next, please. And as I said, you can see absolute distinction between what, what the purpose of each material is, what it's doing, and why it's doing it. And you get the warmth of the timber and to a certain extent the warmth of the stone and the retained walls. Um, but it's a, I, I don't want to for a moment begin to say we can only do things with mass timber. I think there's huge opportunities to look at how do we deal with um, hybrid structures um, where what's the most efficient uh, material um, to use for a particular function. And here, in some places, it's concrete, in other places, it's timber. I think the big thing, though, in all of this is that the need to reduce the amount of concrete we use in the world, because it is, it creates a huge percentage of the greenhouse gases that we, we, ha we produce in the world. And that's partly because concrete, or the cement production in concrete, produces about 8% of the greenhouse gases. And I think where we can avoid using materials that are very destructive in the environment uh, like that, like um, aluminium. If you've ever seen a bauxite mine and what the devastation that's left after all the bauxite has been mined to make aluminium, it's just absolutely horrifying. Um, so we want to be using materials that we can replace and renew. And timber is the most advantageous one of those things at the moment. Okay, next, please. Um, category six, final category. Um, quick, next. Okay, Battersea Art Centre. Um, this was a town hall. Um, very much of that kind of early nineteenth, early twentieth century kind of um, uh, kind of architecture you see all over the country. Kind of um, mixture of things, mixture of baroque and uh, classical and so on. Uh, but this had a problem. The next slide, please. It was absolutely trashed by fire. And you can see here one of the things that is always interesting to point out. When steel, in a fire, steel just melts, it bends, it deforms. Um, in a fire, timber doesn't do that. It chars on the outside, or mass timber anyway, it chars on the outside. Once the charring is complete, the, 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 um, the burning stops and the structural integrity of the beams tends to remain. So I put this in because this building was pretty much destroyed. And in the next slide, you begin to see, I hope, um, what's been done, uh, that a lot of the existing re remaining structures just been left and pieced into it have been a number of things that actually recreate the major spaces in, in, the, in the building. Next, please. And what you see here in this huge um, hall is this kind of extraordinary ceiling that's been recreated. It's, um, and the existing walls, obviously in the fire, they also move, so you don't necessarily have them in the straight line. So you have to do very, very good surveys to then put into the computer so you can do a kind of parametric modeling so that the slight changes in terms of the arches and so on that can, where they're picked up against the buttresses on the walls or the piers, I should say, on the walls. Um, you know, it's modifying it all the time. But this is, uh, I suppose, another kind of form of engineered timber. It's, it's effectively, it's, 
it's three layers of plywood, um, which have all been cut out and CNC machine. They've all been designed and slightly tweaked uh, in shape to form the curvature of this whole structure. Next, please. And what it does is gives incredible acoustic performance to the space in a way that previously it would have been quite a reverberant space in terms of the sound quality. You would get quite a lot of echo. But here you can see in the way the, the CNC machines have, 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 have um, tailored the timber. And within it, within these spaces, then you conceal the lighting, you conceal the, the smoke detectors, the fire alarms, all the gubbins that you would normally find in the, in the ceiling. And, um, and so you have this very, very um, extraordinary kind of sense of the kind of uh, ceiling that might have been there, but in a completely new way, all done in timber and, and curved. Um, so uh, next, please. So I'm going to move on, I think, to um, what that does and what we've done recently, um, because one of the things that I've found over recent years is that I certainly personally get a lot of inquiries from architects and technologists and engineers about different forms of mass timber, what can they do, how do they do it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And part of the reason why I get these inquiries is not because I know lots, I, I probably do know quite a bit, but, but I think it's more to do with the fact that still, even after 20 years or more um, of using things like cross-laminated timber, these things are still not taught in schools of architecture or university departments of engineering or AT courses and so on in any consistent way. So this project here is not, uh, it's, a, it's a project that was involved in some years ago, which we ran some competitions for young architects to design a series of installations along tourist routes in Scotland. And this is beside Loch Lomond. It looks right down the loch. It's a kind of little theatre structure almost. Um, but it's uh, it was all done with timber. It was like young architects who just finished university. They won the competition. Um, we made them set up a practice and this set them off on a whole course of adventure of other projects, if you like. But um, that's a whole other story. It's called the Scenic Roots, Scottish Scenic Roots. And we built a number of projects around Scotland. We're trying to get another phase of it up and running now. Uh, and really to try and punctuate the tourism infrastructure with physical installations. Because most of the tourist board things you find in England, Wales, Scotland are events, you know, the year of this, a year of that. Um, and that's what they do. It's about getting visitors. But when visitors come, you want to actually uh, offer them something. And, and along the routes to destinations, there's quite often nothing in the way of toilets or picnic stops or anything else. So we've tried to set up a program of things to try and do this, but employing young architects and predominantly involving timber constructions. So this kind of kicked off a train of thought to how do we teach uh, students and early career professionals about uh, new timber technologies that they're not being taught in university? How do we prepare them for their career, but also recognize that almost every practice or consultancy nowadays knows they're going to have to build a lot more of the timber. And they haven't been trained in these things either. Some people in the offices might have experienced, but I mean, most don't. So we need to find a different way of doing it because um, Long experience has taught me if you want to do these things in universities, it's a bit like um, changing the direction of a tanker. It takes long, long time to change the curriculum and different things and find people with experience to teach things and so on. So we set up this separate Mass Timber Academy just to focus on this aspect of timber technology. So next slide, please. And I showed you this earlier. I think um, it's, you know, why are we doing it? Because we think the potential to use mass timber is growing exponentially around the world. There are lots of places around the world that are changing their building regulations to make things more possible. In France, for example, recently, uh, the government m mandated that all new public buildings have to be at least 50% uh, bio-based materials, i.e. with timber being the most important one. The 2024 Olympics in Paris are scheduled to have all the buildings made of timber. In uh, North America, Canada has been changing its regulations to make taller buildings and timber. In America, they've had a whole series of acts, competitions, all sorts of things to not just uh, build taller buildings in timber, but also to look at timber innovation, 
uh, and to support that through funding university research, education, competitions, all sorts of um, demonstration projects. Australia changed the reg changing the regulations. So around the world, things are really moving forward, really um, pushing the boundaries of what we could do with timber and how do we do it. Britain has gone backwards a little bit because the Grenfell Tower tragedy really uh, forced a kind of reactive mechanism within government and within the construction industry to introduce regulations, which in theory are to do with preventing the kind of um, fires or the combustion that happened at Grenfell. But um, it's been regressive legislation. It's, it's, there was no timber in Grenfell that caused the fire or contributed to the fire. Um, but it's the regulations have affected use of timber more than for any other material. So we're, we've kind of gone backwards in terms of the limitations we've put on things. But there are a lot of people I'm working with who are working on things to really overcome these things and look at how do we rethink the issues and rethink the, the solutions, if you like. How do we do more with timber but do it in a way that is absolutely safe and we know how to control it. Uh, you know, timber in many ways in a fire is more controllable than for these other materials, but I won't go back over all ground here. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. And <clears throat> my point here is really, this is a um, Museum of Wine in Bordeaux and it's an extraordinary t internal timber structure. And I worked um, some years ago, uh, as the resident architect on the new, as it was said, new Museum of Scotland, and it's a concrete structure with stone cladding and so on. But when the form, and it's quite a complex building, and when the formwork came from um, prefabricated locations to bring these timber structures, they were just beautiful objects in themselves. And at that point, I began to think, why can't we just make the building out of timber rather than just make timber to hold the concrete and then take the timber away and destroy it really it didn't make any sense but also because new timber technologies allow you to move beyond just post and beam structures you'll see a lot of buildings publicized from CLT and glue lamb and so on these days which are effectively what we could have done with steel and concrete a frame structure floor frame post and beam um, and but the way in which we can manufacture timber technology now it doesn't mean we have to follow that orthogonal kind of approach to design we can do much more imaginative things and much more things that are perhaps much more responsive to modern building functions and so and i think in my world um i see amazing research going on in universities in stuttgart in munich in zurich in graz where they're really pushing the boundaries of not just parametric design, but, but boundaries of how we use robot, robotic manufacture, and so on. And these things, this is where the construction industry is going. And that's why I kind of feel very strongly we, we need, you need to learn where it's going. And because if you're not getting taught it now, um, it affects the way you get employment in the future. Okay, next please. And that's just kind of a model of the inside of that building where long column free spans, um, you know, extraordinary shapes and, and so on. We can do all that in timber uh, and it's a lot easier to do it than in other materials. Next, please. So, and you can see in this one, this twisting structure. When I say research that's going on, this is a project that was done by the University of Stuttgart to understand that with with the way trees grow, and the particular trees we've got in the UK, um, they grow spirally. The, the internal cell structure grows spirally. And one of the things that when we dry timber, you quite often see if you look in the home base or whatever, uh, pieces of wood are just have a twist in them, and so they're not very useful. And that's partly because they've been dried too quickly and that the natural twist within the from the tree reasserts itself. Um, now, what they've done in Stuttgart here is to understand that twist and to actually manufacture CLT that uses that twist. So you can see these are CLT panels that curve in two directions. And um, and it's this kind of research that's going on that makes, makes me think that the way forward is really um, rethinking the way we understand wood and understand the things we can do with it. Next, please. And the point here, I was just showing, if you go back to that slide, Ethan, sorry. The point I was showing you is, is trying to join the dots between our forestry industry, the processing, the sawmilling side, the manufacturing of products, 
and how architects and engineers design and how we actually construct. You know, because with uh, computer technology, with BIM and all these kind of things, we can do so many things now that we could never do before. And where that goes in the future is really what excites me. And uh, I hope to convince you to, there might be something that excites you too. Okay, next please. Um, so at the beginning, I put this slide in because this is Shrewsbury Music School. It was built in 1998-99. It was the first use of cross-laminated timber in the UK. And here we are 22 years later, and I still find myself doing talks to um, different audiences about who think it's a new material. And as I said earlier, there's really no formal education about this. And yet around the world, factories are springing up everywhere um, to manufacture CLT. Uh, it's seen as the future by all sorts of people. And the other pro timber products I showed you at the beginning, Daryl laminated timber, laminated linear lumber, they're less well known, they're less well used. Um, so next, please. And so that's one of the things we set up with the academy to take the kind of sense of, you know, what is a CLT panel, break it into a series of stages of education, starting with students, looking at early career professionals, looking at SMEs, and then two kind of unusual things, timber entrepreneurs, as we've called them, people who have learned a lot about it and can actually, you can actually train to teach everyone else in a larger office about what they can do with timber. And then people who have got experience as well, how we innovate, how we do more things, how we do, I work with a range of companies uh, looking at developing new products and construction systems from timber on all sorts of things related to that, whether it's connections or, or whatever. Um, so we're trying to say from student, from, from the moment you qualify through to retirement, there should be a structured programme of education here, um, you know, because uh, most CPD that you get, and I'll be um, provocative here and say, most CPD that I see is rubbish. It's uh, people coming in to sell you bricks or window systems or whatever from week to week. It's uh, something different. It's not consistent. It's not continuous. Uh, and it's not really education because you're not being asked to apply it or, or um, even demonstrate that you've learned things. So we're trying to kind of come at this from a different direction. Next, please. Um, and that's just says, you know, with, in those five stages, how we take you through uh, the future in timber, timber design manufacture construction and do it at your pace and your own sense of direction in your own career. Next please. And there we are, just the, the, the stepping stones from the, the kind of CLT panel, if you like. Next. And it's, it's I would emphasize this is about structure to give you a process of learning that's continuous, it's always up to date and and delivered to you in a way that's independent. We don't take money from companies to sell their products. We, we, we always are about what's the independent ob objective knowledge you need in order to make design decisions, specification decisions. Um, and at every stage of your career, you're, you're working with people who have different levels of knowledge, um, you know, and different levels of experience and so on. So it's trying to find the balance so that there's a, a program that suits everyone to be able to kind of feel their uh, moving forward. Next, please. And just from some of the students we've had involved in it so far, just we've had various testimonials. I just put that one up um, because um, this was someone who felt she knew nothing about timber. Uh, she joined the Tim Mass Timber Academy. We've worked, we work closely with all the students we have to take them through things, to read things, to write things, to do small design projects. Um, which we kind of mentor and so on. And in her um, uh, position, she said very clearly there that she's now really quite confident about this and, and keen to do more. And that's where we want to get people to. So next, please. And I just put this in because this is the Mushtarnet Tower in Norway. It's uh, 84 metres high. It's currently, I think, still the tallest timber building in the world. It's, um, it's glue lamb, it's CLT, there's some concrete towards the top just to weigh the building down in terms of fl the floor system. Um, but it's an extraordinary thing, it has six different um, fire mitigation systems in it. It even has um, sprinklers on the outside walls, um, you know, on the timber cladding. 
you know, so there's a lot of work going on in terms of fire issues and so on around the world. Lots of research going on about what we need to do with buildings with timber to make them as safe as possible. And I put this quote in. Uh, Mark Farmer wrote a uh, document in 2016 for his government called Modernise or Die and saying, the way we're going with the construction industry in the UK, um, we have a problem because a lots of the skilled labour that we had post-Brexit has left. Um, and we're not training enough people, giving them the skills to build in traditional ways. And when I say traditional, I mean kind of brick and block construction, They're, you know, these weather dependent systems that are slow and um, not very accurate. Um, and we know we need to change, but the construction industry takes a lot of changing. It generally only changes when the regulations change and then they have to do it. Um, but I kind of feel with the world that um, working in here, we can do a lot to make things happen uh, because quite apart from anything else, I've done lots of demonstration projects with Timber because you can build something, you can do it and something doesn't quite right, you can change it quite quickly. It's it's um, it's quite easy to do as, in a way that you can't do so easily with concrete or steel or whatever. Uh, next, please. And um, so among all the things we're doing with the Master Timber Academy, we have a whole series of workshops coming up from September onwards where they run for five weeks, five Thursday afternoons, where you learn in depth about each of the main technologies. The first one's about dowel laminated timber because we wanted to start with an unglued system to set the principles for CLT and glue lam and LVL, but really to also introduce a technology that's probably the easiest one to get into manufacturing in the UK. As I said, I've spent somewhere approaching 15 years trying to get CLT into manufacturing in the UK, and it's proved elusive, mainly from the level of investment required. CLT factories in Europe at the moment cost between 15 and 50 million euros to, to build um, and to open and get into production. And generally speaking, in the timber industry in the UK, that's unrealistic kind of sums. But dowel lamination, there's a house here on the, on the left of the screen, which is down in the Scottish borders, it's all um, CLT that was imported from uh, Austria, um, and not DLT, I should say, forgive me. And the other building here is a, a community primary school down in South Wales by Archetype Architects, who did this using local timber to make local um, uh, DLT panels. Those stacked plank panels are generally referred to in Europe as Brechtstapel, um, but there are other forms of DLT, and that's what we want to communicate in this workshop. The design sprint it mentions there is really to have a small design exercise that runs along with what you're alongside what you're learning so you can apply in a small simple project what you've been learning so you can really get a feel for how materials and, and pro products work. Next please. Diddy. So these are just dowel types, um, just to give you a kind of feel for some of the things we'll talk about. Ridged uh, dowels or threaded dowels. Uh, next, please. And there's the kind of plank system I was talking about and the way it's often done manually like this. Um, there are machines that can make it, but most of the time it's small scale. You'll see it done like this if you see it at all. But we're look, really looking to say how can we get more manufacture into place in, in the UK, localised manufacture, not one huge factory because that's just... Um, has been so far unrealisable. Um, what we've tried to look at is saying closer to the forest resources, how do we manufacture locally to get um, and, and build up a kind of, uh, I suppose, local skills as well and sustainable skills. Next, please. And that's just one of those threaded rods through kind of five layers of timber. There's cross lamination as well as diagonal lamination here, but all without glues. Uh, but tightened up as well as using the moisture content difference between the hardwood dowel and the softwood boards. Next please. And just if you're interested, the workshops, the first ones in September from the 2nd to the 30th every Thursday afternoon, uh, we've managed to negotiate some support funding. So if you're interested, uh, the, instead of the full price of 220 for architectural technologists and students, We've got 75% off that. So uh, you can sign up on that at the Mass Timber Academy. And um, and I think that's probably about it. I think there's maybe one more slide. Um, yeah, just to show you a little bit of dull laminated timber there. And just um, contact details if people want more information from me. 
either from about Mastermind Academy or about some of the other things I've talked about there in terms of uh, use of mass timber in traditional buildings or historic buildings, please feel free to get in touch. And we're always happy to help and happy to find out what projects people are working on and find out where uh, they have issues about, well, whatever issues can come up, whether it's to deal with convincing clients or whether it's to deal with convincing your QS or your engineer or whatever. Um, we're always on that case. So. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry for keeping you longer at the beginning. Um, that was a technological challenge uh, orchestrated by Microsoft, I think. So that's a, a negative kind of advert for them. Thanks very much. Superb. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a, a fantastic walkthrough of the, the kind of tests and times of timber where it was, where it's got to. Something that really struck me as well from the very beginning was that uh, timber has always been one of those materials that took a very much a back seat to, as you say, the the mass stones and the concretes and the steels, and it was it's often underestimated as a as a material, um, but has really you know stood the, the the test of time in terms of how versatile it has been it allows for the, uh, the historic retention and historic conservation of existing buildings as well as as new buildings as well. But I'm not going to delay this process any further. Just got um, two questions. One, want to one run past you. Uh, one of which has already been asked, answered uh, by yourself earlier. But I'm going to ask it anyway. Another one has been answered by another member of the audience. But again, just want to run past you for your own thoughts on that as well, Peter. Um, so we had a question early on, of, uh, and you kind of covered this a little bit in terms of the fire standards. And the question was around the topic of, do you see um, any challenges with working with the mass timbers specifically in Scotland in light of the more stringent building standards in regards to fire mitigation and, and management and um, preventing projects moving forward because of perhaps a little bit of risk adverse as opposed to risk aware building standards? Yeah, I think the um Okay, after Grenfell, the, the building regulations in England and Wales changed to reduce the height you could have building in the, in the wall structure, in the complete wall thickness, um, reduced first of all to 18 metres and then to 11. In Scotland, the building standards here were quite different because we've always built with timber. I mean, you know, 80% of the housing in Scotland is timber frame, platform timber frame construction. So most engineers and architects and can contractors understand that aspect of timber technology. Um, the, and also in Scotland, although the regulation is reduces the use of timber above uh, 11 metres, the difference is that our standards in Scotland relate to the cladding, not to the whole wall, wall structure. You know, because in England, the problem has been the, the thickness of the wall any combustible materials are kind of outlawed beyond 11 metres. Now, uh, I have uh, colleagues in uh, in London who have been working, pulling together everybody from insurers to mortgage providers to NHBC and so on to look at how do they then look at building taller buildings in, in, well, in London particularly, but anywhere in England and Wales. Where the and the solution they've been working on at the moment is to separate the cladding completely from the, the actual wall structure, so that you have a maybe a lightweight steel frame uh, holding up the cladding system that's completely separated from this actual structure of the building. So there's no crossover between the cladding materials and the, the structural performance. Um, I think that's all well and good. You know, we can keep looking at these things and, and coming up with solutions. I think part of the difficulty is that when uh, regulation changes come in, um, they're applied indiscriminately and in the sense that in different parts of the country, uh, the, the building control officer in Scotland or the or building inspector in England will um, interpret the regulations in different ways. So you quite often find that you're not where you think you've done something before and you think you can apply it somewhere else, that you come across somebody who, again, it's an education issue that we tend to find that uh, planning, planning officers and building inspectors or building standards officers are, are not always 
really very very up to speed on some of the technologies and particularly with timber there is a tendency to just um want a belt and braces approach you know um protect everything completely and and uh, you know and we need to kind of kind of learn to move beyond that but we can only do it through knowledge and and be able to kind of have an intelligent discussion with the different parties involved in how do we deliver modern modern sustainable buildings you know so i think the the fire issue there, there are mainly i suppose three issues that affect all discussions about tin one is fire one is durability and one is moisture right we want to keep moisture out of buildings um, because and certainly out of timber uh, and I've seen quite a few projects where people have used CLT for the first time. And I don't mean just architects and engineers, I mean contractors. And they just think it's like building with concrete. So they just let water sit on the timber, you know, and then the roofing contractor comes along, plasters a membrane across the wet timber and seals in the moisture. And then you have problems, you know. So it's really it's simple educational things, but also about the way projects are managed in terms of the sequencing of trades that while you can have a moisture control um, strategy for the, the subcontractor installing all the timber, mm -hmm. the follow-on contractors don't necessarily know there's a moisture control strategy or want to follow it or whatever. So there's a, throughout the industry, there's a major educational process to be done. Durability is also to do with understanding um, the kind of nature materials, the kind of species the, the, uh, we're using, what their natural uh, capacity is and the properties of those materials and that again is a uh, it's challenging particularly for engineers because they when asked to do something with timber they're trained in steel and concrete and so if they want to do something timber they kind of oversize it generally and um, but also because they don't understand the difference between species and um, what the some are more structurally effective than others some are more durable than others it's really finding horses for courses and uh, and the thing is, it's a subject you never stop learning about because there are probably 60,000 tree species in the world and a lot of them are useful for construction, but a lot of them aren't. Um, so it's really, uh, I, 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 I suppose from a personal point of view, I find that very kind of uh, interesting because you just learn things all the time. And and the thing, the thing, the good thing about it is because when you work with a lot of um, engineers and clients and um, contractors who don't necessarily know much about it if there's a, an openness to share knowledge then it's an interesting learning experience for everyone you know where there's a resistance to doing so you know where the contractor puts in huge amounts of money in prelims for risk you know and then finds that actually it was a very easy way to build and he's made lots of money and done it quicker and got his team off site quicker and then they become evangelists for it um, that's um, a, a kind of interesting process in itself but I think those, I would say three things, fire, um, durability and moisture. These, if you can deal with those three issues um, uh, competently, then there's not, there's not a problem. There are buildings in Norway, stave churches that have been there for 600 years. It's, it can be a very durable form of construction. Yeah, it's about lifting the level of confidence as well through, as you're calling it, continual development, continual professional education mm -hmm. so that we can have the proper conversations and, and know more about the material science and building physics. I uh, just want to say thanks to Mark Millen, who's in the conversation at the moment. He's been handling the questions and providing some supporting information there from the um, uh, Construction of Scotland Innovation Centre. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, right, I think we'll draw it to a close, Peter, because we've used up way too much of your time today. And it's I, think, been... I think I've used up everyone else's time, <laughs> to be honest. Let's be, let's be clear. Um, technology today defeated me. Um, I'll have a word with Bill Gates about this. <laughs> yeah, please do. Please do. Right. I uh, just want to say thanks again to, to Peter Wilson and Timber Design uh, Initiatives for taking the time this afternoon to introduce us to the world of uh, mass timber, designing with mass timber, also the types of styles and architecture, but also the building physics and the building uh, material properties around that as well. Uh, information on how to contact Peter is in the chat, so please feel free to download that if you need to have uh, any further conversations or to help to convert others around you, trades, skill, uh, different skill sets, etc. 
Uh, we will leave it just there today. Uh, any questions I haven't picked up in the chat, we will uh, push those over to Peter and get them answered if we can. But other than that, thank you to everyone who joined us today on behalf of CIAT Yorkshire and CIAT Scotland East Region. Thank you for spending the time with us and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. And please do pay attention to the uh, LinkedIn pages for Yorkshire and for Scotland East Region because we will have more information soon about how to sign up to uh, Peter's Design with Mass Timber courses and the design sprints that will be coming very soon. So looking forward to spending more time with you uh, in September, Peter. But for now, thanks to everyone and uh, thanks again to Peter. And we'll, oh, Peter, do you want to say something? Just thanks to Ethan for saving our lives there, for um, being very quietly and competently kind of managing to get us through the presentation. Much appreciated. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Right. Well, cheerio for now, and we'll see you all at the next Knowledge Exchange event.